Welcome to Module 7. This is the seventh installment in the Emerging Infectious Disease videos for pre-hospital providers series. In this video, we will be discussing infectious waste disposal and equipment decontamination after completion of patient care and related activities. This instructional series was created by the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Department of Emergency Health Services, with assistance from the Maryland Department of Health, the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, and funding from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In this module, we will go over the steps of ambulance decontamination and introduce you to current decontamination systems and technology. We will also discuss the protocols of waste disposal and go over the CDC's standard operating procedures for decontamination of an ambulance that has transported a patient with suspected or confirmed Ebola and other highly infectious diseases. Multiple studies have shown that patients leave their microbes behind when they exit the ambulance. Studies done over the last 15 years have demonstrated that ambulances often retain unacceptably high levels of microbial contamination after the run is completed. The best way to assure that these microbes don't move on to other people, including yourself, your patients, and your family, is to consistently follow the best practice guidelines. Compliance with best practices for cleaning and disinfecting of EMS vehicles and equipment is an important factor in preventing the spread of infections. Decontamination of ambulances and their equipment must take place after each patient transfer. After transferring the patient, the ambulance should be decontaminated outside of the ambulance bay, where you are not blocking incoming ambulance traffic at the receiving facility. If decontamination at the receiving facility is not possible, the ambulance should be brought back to the station and decontaminated there. Comprehensive decontamination may be scheduled periodically at the EMS station according to jurisdictional protocols. For more extensive deep cleaning, the same cleaning agents used after each patient transfer can be utilized. It is recommended to have a checklist for regular cleaning and clear communication regarding responsibilities and task division. Please note, ambulance decontamination protocols may vary in different jurisdictions. In this series, we will provide you with protocols based on best practices. However, you must follow your jurisdiction's protocols. As defined in the previous module, decontamination is the process of removing or destroying pathogenic contaminants and therefore preventing pathogens from spreading and causing illnesses. There are three levels of decontamination, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. The level of decontamination that must be used depends on the level of contamination. Based on the risk of infection, there are three levels of contamination, critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. A critical level of contamination includes objects that come into contact with the patient's skin or enter the vascular system. An example would be IV catheters, needles, and syringes. Objects that are critically contaminated must be sterilized unless they are of single use. If they are designed for single use, they should be properly deposited in the red biohazard bags and sharps containers. A semi-critical level of contamination includes items that come into contact with mucous membranes such as oxygen masks, resuscitation bags, and intubation blades. Objects that are semi-critically contaminated could be decontaminated with an EPA-approved high-level disinfectant or sterilized unless they are single-use. A non-critical level of contamination includes objects that come into contact with intact skin but not mucous membranes, such as stethoscopes, stretchers, and radios. Objects that are non-critically contaminated must be disinfected with an EPA-approved disinfectant. High-risk surfaces in an ambulance are those that are frequently touched by hands, gloved or ungloved. These surfaces pose a higher risk of transmitting pathogens and require decontamination between every patient encounter. Example high-risk surfaces are stretchers and railings, door handles, computer keyboards, stethoscopes, 
monitoring equipment and control panels, steering wheels, work surfaces, radios, light switches, and oxygen bottle valves. Low risk surfaces are those that have minimal contact with hands. These surfaces require cleaning on a regular basis or after contamination occurs. Ambulance floors, walls, ceilings, and windows are considered to be low risk surfaces unless they become contaminated. Now let's begin with the ambulance decontamination procedure. There are four main steps for ambulance decontamination. First, site setup and preparation. Second, decontaminate the ambulance exterior. Third, decontaminate the patient compartment and equipment. And fourth, decontaminate the driver cabin. Site setup and preparation. If possible, it is best to perform decontamination procedures in a large, well-ventilated, enclosed structure that is protected from weather elements. After parking the ambulance in the designated area, begin the decontamination procedure by preparing the cleaning and decontamination products and the appropriate PPE. At a minimum, you will need an isolation gown and gloves. Masks, shoe covers, and eye protection can be worn if necessary depending on the level of contamination, method of decontamination, or the suspected pathogen. For example, if you are using disinfectant wipes, then you must wear gloves and an isolation gown. However, if you are using a spray bottle with an EPA-approved disinfectant solution, then eye protection and an N95 mask must be worn in addition to gloves and an isolation gown. For decontamination of the ambulance, you will need EPA-registered disinfectant wipes, disposable paper towels, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and a red biohazard bag. If necessary, you might also need a mop and a household bleach solution. Start donning the appropriate PPE by sanitizing your hands with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, then put on the isolation gown and your gloves. If blood contamination is visible, Shoe covers must be worn, otherwise everywhere you step in or outside of the ambulance must also be decontaminated. Your shoes must be non-porous and decontaminated with EPA-approved disinfectant wipes after ambulance cleaning is completed. Decontamination of the ambulance exterior. To decontaminate the exterior of the ambulance, use EPA-approved disinfectant wipes on all surfaces that might have been touched during patient transfer, such as door handles, mirrors, and windows. Make sure to use a new disinfectant wipe for each area, object, or surface. If blood contamination is visible, it must be cleaned with a disposable paper towel first and then disinfected with EPA-approved disinfectant wipes. Make sure to sanitize your gloved hands with alcohol-based hand sanitizer after dealing with blood contamination and before you move on to decontaminating a different part of the ambulance. All used disinfectant wipes and paper towels must be discarded in the red biohazard bag. Once the decontamination of the exterior is completed, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer to decontaminate your gloved hands and then remove your gloves and discard appropriately in the red biohazard bag. To prepare for the next step of the decontamination process, sanitize your hands with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer and put on new gloves. Decontamination of the patient compartment. Now you may begin the decontamination of the patient compartment. First, Remove the stretcher and any other large equipment from the ambulance. Remove used or soiled linen and place it in the designated bag for laundering. Using EPA-approved disinfectant wipes, wipe down all of the stretcher rails and handles. Wipe down the frame of the stretcher, making sure to check the undercarriage and the wheels of the stretcher.
Make sure to use a new wipe every time you move to decontaminating a new surface. All used disinfectant wipes must be discarded in the red biohazard bag. Note, at least once per shift, you should remove the mattress from the frame and clean the entire mattress with disinfectant. When you are done with decontaminating the stretcher, put it aside and move on to the next step of decontaminating the patient compartment. Begin decontaminating the inside of the patient compartment by checking for any visible blood and bodily fluid contamination. Clean any blood and other bodily substances with disposable towels starting from the outside moving toward the center of the spill. After the visible spill is cleaned, use EPA-approved disinfectant wipes to disinfect the contaminated surface. All used disposable towels and wipes must be discarded appropriately in the red biohazard bag. Sanitize your gloved hands and then discard the gloves in the red biohazard bag immediately. Sanitize your hands with alcohol-based hand sanitizer and don new gloves. Now, begin with removing any loose waste out of the patient compartment and discard it in the red biohazard bag. Using EPA-approved disinfectant wipes, Decontaminate all surfaces and equipment that you might have come in contact with during patient transfer. Pay particular attention to the door handles, jump bags, tough books, radios, monitors and leads, BP cuffs, stethoscopes, oxygen valves, grab rails, walls, and seats. Remember, you must use a new disinfectant wipe each time you begin decontaminating a different surface or piece of equipment. All used disinfectant wipes must be discarded in the red biohazard bag. Now that all surfaces and equipment have been decontaminated, don't forget to check the waste compartment and the sharps containers in the ambulance. The waste receptacle and sharps container should not be more than three quarters full. If the sharps box or waste receptacles have reached their capacity, you must seal them properly and remove them from the ambulance. Replace them with a new red biohazard bag and a new sharps box. Waste disposal will be discussed in more detail later in this module. The floor of the patient compartment should be decontaminated using a diluted bleach solution and a mop. Note, the ground outside the patient compartment is now also contaminated since you have been in and out of the ambulance. Do not forget to decontaminate the surrounding environment using the mop and bleach solution. It is best to use disposable mop heads and discard them in the red biohazard bag. Otherwise, the mop head must be decontaminated after use. To decontaminate mop heads, wring the water out of the mop and wash it separately in a washing machine with household bleach and hot water and then let it dry. In addition, all other cleaning products must be decontaminated, including the disinfectant wipe container and the alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Now that you have decontaminated all the surfaces and equipment of the patient compartment, you may start the PPE doffing process. First, take off your gown, followed by the gloves. While sitting on a designated doffing chair, remove the shoe covers and step out of the decontamination zone one foot at a time to prevent any cross-contamination. If shoe covers were not used, then you must decontaminate your shoes with EPA-approved disinfectant wipes. Afterwards, perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Finally, return the onboard cleaning products and the stretcher with clean linens back to the ambulance. Also, Make sure to check for any materials and equipment that needs to be restocked. Decontamination of the cabin. The
The last step of ambulance decontamination is the decontamination of the front cab. Sanitize your hands with alcohol-based hand sanitizer and wear the appropriate PPE, including a gown and gloves. Begin with clearing the cabin of any loose trash. Note that non-infectious waste, such as food wrappers and disposable cups, must be discarded in regular trash bags and not in the red biohazard bags. Using an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe, clean the dashboard, steering wheel, door handles, side windows, rearview mirror, radio, and any other electronic equipment. Note, you must use a new wipe for each object. Vacuum or wipe down the seats and the floor of the cabin with EPA-approved disinfectant. All used disinfectant wipes must be discarded in the red biohazard bag. Perform hand hygiene on your gloved hands with alcohol-based hand sanitizer, remove your gloves, and discard them in the red biohazard bag. Sanitize your hands with alcohol-based hand sanitizer and wash with soap and water when available. Remember, routine cleaning and disinfection may not be adequate to remove some pathogens that are highly contagious and also resistant to antimicrobial products such as C. diff, MRSA, tuberculosis, hepatitis B and C, and norovirus. In this case, you must use a diluted 1 to 10 bleach solution or EPA-approved high-level disinfectant wipes. Note, if a spray bottle is used to spray the diluted bleach solution, you must wear an N95 mask and eye protection in addition to gloves and a fluid-resistant gown. Another method of ambulance decontamination is the use of a portable decontamination system. The use of these systems may be most helpful following the transport of a patient with a virus or bacteria that is highly contagious or life-threatening, as well as resistant to antimicrobial products. These decontamination systems operate by dispersing a disinfectant or a sterilant inside the ambulance via vapor, fog, or mist techniques to kill microorganisms that could possibly cause disease. Some of these systems can be automated where they operate unattended. Examples of current technology that are being used today include the BioQuell BQ EMS, which uses hydrogen peroxide vapor to eradicate pathogens from exposed surfaces. The vapor generator is placed in a sealed vehicle and a wireless control panel is used to start and stop the decontamination cycle. Note that the interior of the ambulance must be prepared first before activating the system to ensure all exposed surfaces are decontaminated. The Aeroclave ADS, which is installed inside the patient compartment and employs an EPA-approved hospital disinfectant dispersed through a nozzle. And the Ambustat system, which disperses small droplets of actual cold sterilant, a disinfectant with parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Using a combination of both manual and portable decontamination systems is recommended to achieve the most effective and efficient decontamination of ambulances, especially after transferring patients with suspected or confirmed highly infectious diseases. It is important to follow the decontamination system manual as well as the instructions here regarding the process of disinfecting or discarding any gowns, gloves, and clothing you may have been wearing during the use of the portable ambulance decontamination systems because some of these systems may inadvertently aerosolize the pathogens you are trying to eliminate. Wearing an N95 mask while conducting the disinfection process will also provide you further protection. Make sure that your ambulance is in good condition. Surfaces and floors of the ambulance should be smooth finished, intact, durable, washable, and impervious to fluids. If you notice any damaged surfaces in the ambulance, you must notify your supervisor and request that they get repaired. It is always best to deal with blood and bodily fluid spills quickly and effectively. The longer contaminants sit around, the more opportunity they have to infect someone who could be you. These bits of advice might seem like common sense, but are frequently not followed. Remember not to damage the equipment you are using, such as electronics, while cleaning. Do not spray disinfectant solutions directly on electronics. 
Instead, use disinfectant wipes to clean these items. When using sprayed disinfectant solutions, do not let the solution dry completely before wiping the surface. Finally, do not reuse wipes on different objects. It is time for a learning checkpoint. Take a look at this picture and see if you can identify the error made by the provider. If you said that electronic devices should not be sprayed directly, then you were right. Spraying electronic devices directly might damage them. An EPA-approved disinfectant wipe is more efficient in decontaminating electronic equipment in the ambulance. Waste Management In this section, we will discuss best practices in handling medical waste during and after patient transfer. Safe and effective waste management is essential in preventing the spread of infectious diseases and contamination of the environment. Also known as biological waste, biohazardous waste, or infectious medical waste, regulated medical waste is the portion of waste that may be contaminated by blood, bodily fluids, or other potentially infectious materials and therefore poses significant risk of spreading infections. The three most common classes of infectious waste in EMS are contaminated materials, sharps, and linens. Contaminated materials include disposable PPE such as gloves, gowns, and masks, all single-use tools, equipment that came in contact with a patient, and all materials that are contaminated with blood or bodily fluids. All contaminated materials must be disposed of in the red biohazard bag. Make sure not to dispose of other non-contaminated materials such as food or food wrappers in the red bag. Do not let waste in the waste bin reach over three quarters of the bin's capacity. Take out the red biohazard bag, seal it, and dispose of it in the designated area at the receiving medical facility. Immediately replace it with a new red biohazard bag after ensuring that the new bag is intact and there are no holes or leaks. Appropriate PPE, gloves and gowns at minimum, must be worn when handling contaminated materials. All devices with sharp points or edges that can puncture or cut skin, such as needles, syringes, lancets, auto-injectors, and infusion sets must be immediately placed in the sharps container to reduce the risk of needle sticks and cuts. Do not let the sharps container reach over three quarters of the container's capacity. Seal the biohazard sharps container and dispose of it according to your jurisdictional protocols. Make sure to immediately replace it with a new sharps container. Appropriate PPE must be worn while handling sharps. Note, you should never throw needles in the regular trash, flush them down the toilet, or dispose of them in the recycling bins. Single-use disposable ambulance linen packs are recommended for use in all ambulances, especially when dealing with a patient with a known or suspected infectious disease. Reusable linens must be handled depending on the level of contamination. Use linens which have become soiled by general use but have not been contaminated by blood or bodily fluids should be placed into the designated linen bags and dropped off at the receiving medical facility. Other linens that are contaminated by blood or bodily fluids or have been used on a patient with a known or suspected infectious disease must be appropriately disposed of in a red biohazard bag, sealed, and dropped off at the receiving medical facility. Prior to completing the ambulance decontamination process, make sure no waste, and especially no medical waste, is left behind at the decontamination site. Remember, decontamination of the surrounding environment is also a part of the ambulance decontamination process. Under no circumstances should any item of clinical waste be placed in domestic waste bins or abandoned outside designated containers or in the back of an ambulance. Biohazardous waste should only be deposited in containers designed for medical waste, which are managed by specially trained personnel. It's time for a learning checkpoint. Take a look at this picture and see if you can identify the error the providers made. If you said that the provider should never leave the site before making sure that nothing was left behind, then you were correct. Remember, 
cleaning the surrounding environment after decontaminating the ambulance is part of the decontamination process. All medical waste and other types of waste must be disposed of appropriately before leaving the decontamination site. Ambulance decontamination for known or suspected Ebola and other highly infectious diseases has received considerable attention from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention since the recent Ebola outbreak in 2014. Because changes are occasionally made to the regulations or guidance, it is recommended that your infection control officer log in on a monthly basis to check for any updates. In most cases of transporting a patient with known or suspected highly infectious diseases, specially trained teams will take over the process of decontaminating the ambulance and all related equipment. If a designated team is not immediately available, the ambulance should be taken out of service until a specialized team can take over the responsibility for decontaminating the unit. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provide information on the procedures for ambulance decontamination in the case of caring for and transporting a patient with a known or suspected highly infectious disease, such as Ebola. Links to the CDC resources can be found in the resources section below this video for your reference. Remember, decontamination is one of the first steps in protecting yourself, colleagues, families, and communities. The work of decontaminating an ambulance and its equipment may seem mundane, but it is a critical step in breaking the chain of infection, and it's in your hands. Thank you for joining us for Module 7. Additional resources can be found in the links below this video. In the next module, we will discuss transport considerations for patients with highly infectious diseases and operational considerations for the use of portable isolation units.